Hello guys and welcome to this lecture about differential diagnosis of radiolucent lesions using CBCT. So it's very important uh, for us to know how to work with the multiplanar reconstructions and even the 3D reconstructed models and take advantage of all these images for us to define our differential diagnosis list properly. Okay, so without further ado, let's see how this works. So we have here uh, the use of the CBCT MPR, right? So what is this? It's, of course, the three orthogonal planes in a way that we can angle or tilt the axis of the other planes. So we have here now the three different windows. This is a screenshot of the Horus uh, software from the Horus project, of course, for, for Apple computers. But there are also Windows uh, compatible softwares, as you guys know, the Dolphin, the Invesalius, the Brazilian software, Okay, just to let you guys know. And then here I am tilting the axis to diagnose the alveolar bone. So we, you guys can see that we have a horizontal bone loss. So the level of the alveolar crest is now decreased due to resorption. We have this huge edentulous area. There is even a buccal uh, plate defect on the premolar side, so more anterior to the, to the axis. We have sinus membrane thickening as well in this image here, so in the cross-sectional image we can see here and then of course the condition of these molars right so they're basically endoperial lesions because they are also being um, not only periapical lesions but also vertical bone defects associated with the lesions and then forcation exposure of course you guys are seeing the forcation exposure here on this molar as well the, with a uh, horizontal bone loss uh, in the mandible as well so a lot of alterations. We can always uh, assess the level of the, uh, not only the level, but also the density of the bone, okay? How to assess? You cannot assess the density of the bone itself, but you can assess the pixel values, okay? Which are proportional to the density of the alveolar bone, okay? So there are several papers describing this methodology, so you, can, you could always use this depending on the clinical situation, all right? And don't forget that many times you are going to use CBCT for surgical planning as well, not only for diagnosis. So uh, to diagnose the alveolar bone conditions, then of course you want to tilt the axis of the three orthogonal planes, okay? This is still the uh, coronal plane, the axial plane and the sagittal plane, but now they are uh, tilted, of course, to be parallel or perpendicular to the structures that we want to assess, okay? That's the secret with CBCT. Then we have the uh, loss of the alveolar bone here, so marginal bone loss of this tooth, which is basically the horizontal bone loss of the alveolar crest, even buccal and lingual bone loss, you can see here, with uh, periodontal ligament space widening, okay? So take a look at this. Even in the axial plane, I can see uh, periodontal ligament space widening at the buccal aspects of this root here. So a lot of things that we can assess here as well. Presence of calculus, so you know those would be hyperdense or radiopaque. Here is hyperdense because it's 3D, so small hyperdense images at the cervical uh, aspects of the root, for example, or, or even the crown. So now we have vertical bone defects. So now we have here a lingual bone defect. It's not the most common situation, but we can diagnose this as our axis is completely parallel uh, to the tooth, to the long axis of this tooth. So calculus here, interproximal calculus, you guys are seeing here, uh, horizontal bone loss of the edentulous span here, okay? Uh, and then even the endoperial lesion uh, in, the, in the maxilla. But we need, uh, of course, to, t to bring all the axis to the maxilla if we want to assess this region properly, okay? So now we are assessing only this tooth, okay? Very good. Uh, can we use the 3D reconstructions as well? And that's basically the 3D reconstruction of the same case. Well, yes, to complement the diagnosis, okay? But the diagnosis is made on MPR images, okay? On multiplanar reconstruction. Here, for surgical planning, you can see in 3D, for example, this crowd in here is well depicted uh, in 3D, okay? Uh, the well a 3d uh, image of the bone loss so bone loss happens in 3d of course so the 3d reconstruction uh, the 3d reconstructions will be useful as well for that but again the MPR is the one that needs to be used properly to diagnose conditions okay 
So now let's talk about periapical lesions with CBCT. And of course, we are seeing a periapical lesion, hypodense now or radiolucent, uh, well limited, homogeneous, okay, small symmetric uh, lesion, periapical lesion, okay. And uh, it's very small, uh, so the, for the moment, the, the uh, first option of the radiographic diagnosis would be uh, a periapical granuloma. Uh, so let's see, uh, this is only the diagnosis of one of the roots. Now we go for the distal root of this molar. Okay, and then uh, you guys are seeing that the, the, the planes here are, are actually inverted, but it doesn't make any difference. It's the axial plane that is always telling us which side of the patient we are talking about. So the, the, the assessment is happening in the left side of the patient because it's the right side of your screen in relation to the axial plane. Okay, so don't forget about this. Okay, go back in this explanation again if you got confused. It's very simple. Axial plane is the one to define the size always. Okay, so this is the left side of the patient. All right, so now we have the distal root situation and then even the... the continuation of this periapical lesion to the furcation area. And then when we see the palatal roots, it's completely different. I think it's even, uh, not sure if it's actually the same case, but it doesn't matter, right? So this is the diagnosis of a palatal root now. And now we have an endoperial lesion. Okay, so the endoperial lesion with uh, fenestration of the palatal plate as well and root resorption. That's why the apex is now different, the, sh the shape, okay? Very good. So uh, we need to diagnose all the conditions. So please feel free to pause the video now, okay, and diagnose all conditions of this of this image, okay. So I, I hope you guys were able to do this. We have here periapical, uh, so a hypodense image suggestive of periapical granuloma. Of course, you guys know that it's suggestive because the uh, definitive diagnosis would be the biopsy, of course, right? Uh, then even areas with um, sclerosis, bone sclerosis, the vertical bone defect here, okay, so the vertical bone defect, and there are uh, the impacted uh, third molar here, of course, so we have also other conditions to discuss about this case. All right, now endoperial lesions, again, uh, we have the vertical bone defect in communication or in continuation, uh, that's why, uh, that's how we usually say in radiology, Okay, in continuation to the periapical lesion. Okay, all right, so we have here uh, the buccal plate fenestration as well, root resorption happening. Okay, so all these conditions need to be diagnosed properly with not only vertical bone defect, but horizontal bone defects. Take a look at the level of the ovular crest. Okay, so and this, of course, is the sinus septum. Okay, so the sinus floor and the sinus septum. I hope you guys realize that. Okay. Now we need, again, if we need to diagnose every single tooth, then of course we need to do that with cross-sectional images, okay? These images here, parasagital transaxial or cross-sectional images. Uh, now we are seeing a cross-sectional image of this tooth and then, you know, the, the, maybe the, the core, the post was too big and then now it's resorbed the root. This is a completely failing restoration with buccal plate resorption as well and the periapical alterations here as well. Root resorption, and then uh, you need to diagnose the... Here, we, it could be also uh, uh, that the presence of the metallic artifacts from the uh, root canal treatment is affecting this assessment, but then, you know, you can see uh, root resorption when there is, uh, okay? So you, you need to, of course, to assess in the three different uh, planes, and then you could be able usually to diagnose uh, the root resorption by seeing the shape of this root, okay? Now we have radicular cysts, just a case of radicular cyst. Again, hypodense, well limited, symmetric, inflammatory re uh, reasons, maybe a little bit of root resorption involved, but that's actually not common, okay? Uh, with thinning of the palatal plate now, okay? The lesion is extending up to the uh, nasal floor and even the sinus floor, Okay, and basically the lesion is centralized in the palatal root of this first premolar, okay? Although even the buccal root is also uh, associated with the lesion now.
Lateral periodontal cysts, the one that usually happens uh, in the mandible between canine and first premolar or between first and second premolars and in the usually the middle third of the root or, or the beginning of the apical third of the root. Again, well limited, symmetric, with corticated borders, uh, homogeneous, just like any other cyst. Okay, round as well, that's another characteristic. All right, and this is basically uh, the characteristics of a lateral periodontal cyst. And of course, there are other alterations here in this image, right? So take a look at the left of the alveolar bone crest. The integral cyst, so this case I already showed in one of the previous uh, lectures and videos, uh, the dentigial the, the cyst that is here, okay, so this is the coronal panoramic uh, uh, image, so this is now an implant planning software. You can use implant planning softwares to plan surgeries, for example, and then, of course, uh, they can be useful as well. But don't forget that these 3D images can be exported to STL files and be 3D printed as rapid prototyping models, all right? And this, is, uh, this can be useful for planning surgeries, okay, and even performing surgical guides, uh, depending on the surgical procedure that we are talking about. Okay, there is even a hyperdense alteration here, so I will allow you guys to pause the video and try by yourself to diagnose this hyperdense lesion I already commented in one of my lectures uh, to you guys. All right, and then we have the, the mapping of the mandibular canal, okay, where we have the alveolar the inferior alveolar nerve, but the, the name is mandibular canal. That, that's what we see in the, in the CBCT, right? So we see the mandibular canal. And then the axial slice here, and the green line is now the axis telling you the shape of the coronal panoramic image, okay? So, of course, this would be the lateral pattern of a dentigial cyst. That's a, at least the first diagnosis. It's well attached to the CEJ, as dentigial cysts usually happen mostly associated to impacted uh, lower third molars and upper canines. This is the surgery, just to show to you guys the cyst. Again, it's the same citation. And the cyst was enucleated. So this is now the cyst out of the uh, cavity. You know, that's the aspect of the cyst because it's uh, all the epithelial tissue surrounding the cyst. Okay, that's enucleation. Let's see an OKC case now. So uh, you guys are seeing this OKC case, and then we have uh, a very common characteristic of the OKCs that we can see in CBCT, which is that they are long lesions, okay? So mesial distally, they are long usually, all right? Uh, with less buccal lingual plate expansion as compared, for, uh, as compared with a meloblastoma, for example, okay? Now, they can also be multilocular. Usually, they are not. They are unilocular. Okay, and then there is always the risk of recurrence. Root displacement, we are seeing here. Okay, root displacement. And all the aggressiveness of the lesion. So, the lesion is extending upwards to the alveolar crest and downwards to the base of the mandible. A case of the maxilla. Uh, and then, uh, an OKC in the maxilla can have this appearance here because the sinus get uh, inflamed as well, and then the lesion, which is radiolucent, is now, of course, a little bit more uh, radiopaque in relation to the radiolucency of the sinus, okay? Even uh, associated with an impacted crown, with an impacted tooth, which can also happen for OKC cases. So now, which is this lesion? We are still talking about cysts, Take a look at this, feel free to pause the video and give me in the comments the answer or send to me the answers uh, because this is a, you know, a very characteristic lesion that you guys should be able to diagnose by now. All right, the same citation is there. Okay, now a meloblastoma and, and then of course we have, take a look at the difference, buccal lingual plate expansions and the lesion is usually not so long, okay? This is described by the book of uh, Professor McDonald as uh, the beach ball aspect, okay? So it's a term described by science. And then we can see here the expansion, okay? So the buccal lingual expansion, even expansion of the ovular crest, okay? Association with an impacted tooth. But usually a meloblastoma happens in the fifth decade of life uh, more commonly, okay? So patients are older in relation to patients of OKC, for example. Mixoma, and then we have the lesions where we have uh, 
a lot of bone inside the lesion. So now this is not a lesion of epithelial origin uh, in contrast with a meloblastoma in OKC. The origin of myxoma is mesenchymal, all right? So uh, now we can see that this lesion has um, bone inside, trapped inside the lesion. It's low growth, but of course it's an odontogenic tumor. Don't forget about this. And the lesion has an aspect, a uh, soft tissue aspect. It's a different aspect. And the lesion is also common in the mandible, all right? Uh, uh, now, the most common pattern of multilocular lesions is the tennis racket pattern, which means that we can see the angles between the trabeculi uh, trapped inside the lesion, okay? Uh, the most common pattern of multilocular ameloblastoma is, uh, or multicystic ameloblastoma, is the uh, soap bubbles, okay, or honeycomb. All right. So now we can see the lesion, uh, so this is another case, but we can see the bone with, you know, these angles, well-defined well angles of bone trapped inside the lesion, and the lesion is more heterogeneous as compared to a meloblastoma. Okay? Now another case, that's the citation of this case, and a case of a pediatric patient, the lesion uh, showing as a heterogeneous lesion, okay? in the OPG, and then in the cross-sectional image, we see uh, that the lesion has some expansion and the lesion is heterogeneous, okay? So, uh, a little bit different as compared to the uh, ameloblastoma. Now, giant central cell granuloma, that's an aggressive lesion with a lot of buccolingual uh, plate expansions, multilocular, so we can see that this is multilocular, this is not artifacts or anything else, with buccal plates thinning and even resorption of buccal plates, okay, even lingual plates as well. So this is an aggressive lesion usually, like we are seeing here, okay? And the 3D reconstructed model could be useful to plan the surgery. And cherubism, okay, uh, patients are very young. We, we know that those are bilateral multilocular lesions, okay? But, uh, well, they can still be um, well-diagnosed uh, and, and even the surgery can be planned using 3D imaging, of course, right? So a lot of buccal lingual plate expansions, bilateral lesions, impacted tooth, uh, and of course all these alterations. <clears throat> and this is just a review for us. Feel free to pause the video and diagnose and <laughs> actually <clears throat> tell us which are all the letters, but I hope you guys will be able to, to diagnose this properly as you guys should be ready to do that. This is the article recommended today, okay? So it's actually from Professor McDonald as well, uh, published in 2016, and it's, um, uh, you know, and it's a good article describing the aspects of the radiolucent lesions using CBCT, okay? Which is actually the topic of this video. So if you guys like, please hit the like button, and see you guys in the next lectures.